And the Klingons, I did a similar thing. So you know the Klingons, Trekkies. Um, they started off as white dudes with bronzer and some facial hair. And over time, and that's a Klingon, um, they evolved into something that was far more an extreme character and eventually found its way into the world of Worf for the TV series, which in some ways was a byproduct of repeatable, affordable um, makeup that Mr. Westmore um, was doing for the series. And my job with JJ was to reimagine, and I, I say that with a grain of salt, because it has to look like a Klingon, yet we have to bring something, quote unquote, new and fresh to the table, but it's gotta look like a Klingon. Uh, what do you do? And knowing that there are serious Klingon fans out there, it's, uh, I felt it was very important waters to tread mindfully and respectfully. So the process was going into ZBrush and, well, first, finding a guy that looked like a Klingon. And one of the grips on set, which I'll get to here in a second, this guy. He already looks like a Klingon. He's fantastic. You know, he's hanging lights and stuff. And I thought, can I just borrow you for, like, two minutes. Let me photograph you and I'm gonna turn you into a Klingon and who knows, it might work out the end of being a Klingon, um, which it didn't. But from here, I dropped this image into Photoshop. I sculpted on top of it a simple face after I immersed his image into what felt like the Klingon worship. I took a piece of that sculpt from ZBrush, dropped it in, and that's just a simple gray render, nothing special and then set it to, I think, probably screen. And that just gave me the highlights. And I may have doubled it up and done um, overlay, for example. You just play with different settings. And that gave me the base for the Klingon sculpt. So I knew that that process was gonna lend itself to very quickly generating some images for JG to kind of get a sense of what this is gonna be like. Cut to the day I needed to show facial hair, because that's a big part of what Klingons are. I always knew that I wanted to push the idea of a bald Klingon and take that bony ridge and extend it across the top of their skull and bring it down the back and down the chest. I thought that'd be interesting, but we knew that we wanted to play with facial hair. The, that morning, I swear to God, you guys had just announced hair, fiber, fiber mesh. I thought, this is not a good time to start experimenting because I have a presentation with JJ, probably at noon, to show hair, oh, let me open up a new piece of uh, gear in ZBrush and burn all my time trying to figure it out. The amazing thing was, really, it's one of the rare moments where right out of the box, it worked. And these were the renderings from that morning, which is so awesome. They're not great. I'm sharing them with you because it was one of those moments where a tool just worked. I mean, no offense to ZBrush saying that other tools don't, but this is a complex new thing how, and I've worked with hair in other programs and it's just not easy. This was easy, fast, and it allowed me to show enough ideas of graphically how the hair could be on our Klingons. It was so awesome. I came in like a total freaking hero. Cause you know, nobody really knew. And JJ's, uh, he's got his finger on the pulse, particularly with ZBrush. And I came in with a, how'd you do that? Well, it's proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> I developed it. So this was kind of the ending result of all that effort as it resided in ZBrush. We had a, a range though of Klingons. Not only were we trying to figure out the appropriate look of the Klingon, but once we had the appropriate look of that race, now what about variations on a theme so that we have specific other characters? And these were some of them, slightly variations on a theme, but primarily exploring different ways of making a Klingon look like it's of that race, but giving it character via different types of ridging. These are all rendered in Moto, just so you know. Also playing with contact lenses. These are true designs, honest designs. And by that, which is a really important thing to bring up, <clears throat> excuse me, something I talk about in my design classes, is that you, when you present something to a client, it has to be something that is genuine and real and not something that has to be fixed along the way, the pipeline, so that it does work. You've got a fantastic open mouth creature with giant teeth and you submit that, the director likes it because it's got drama, it's dynamic, its mouth is open, how can you, how can you lose? 
And then somebody has to build it, practically or digitally, and eventually shut the mouth, and the teeth don't close properly, so they have to fix the teeth, and actually the, the lips don't go over the teeth. And we realized that that design that was approved, that we now spent thousands of dollars, we come to realize it doesn't work. That doesn't bode well for you, the designer. So in regards to doing this makeup, I used a real head of a real actor as a base to do my makeup design on top of. So I'm doing virtual makeup using ZBrush. So I take that head, I make it green, I duplicate the head, I make that brown, for example, or some clay color. And then from there, I've got the two directly on top of each other. So as I'm sculpting, it can only be additive. Anything that's subtractive means either it's just not gonna work as a practical effect, or we're gonna have to digitally augment, which is expensive and you better have a good justification for it. So everything that you see is an additive process, with the exception of a couple. Um, and I'm playing with skin tones, I'm playing with scarification, slight changes in massing around the neck, et cetera, et cetera. Playing with the overall shape and the simplicity or the complexity of the ridging. Get to this guy, which is a digital effect that I proposed to JG, and that is Klingons are badass. You know, I, I, this is a good day to die, I believe is one of their quotes. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to have one who's missing an eye and all you're seeing is the orbital cavity and for him, it's just, it's no big deal. And to prove that, I had found that, actually this was the inspiration for it, and if this is offensive, I apologize, but it's a great reference of a gentleman who unfortunately lost his eye to cancer. But I thought that'd be, that's off-putting. And you put that in the context of a Klingon, I thought that could be kind of a neat thing. And not to sound callous to somebody who went through an ordeal, but I thought that that could be a potentially cool character thing, but it meant spending some bucks doing the Voldemort technique of greening out that particular zone and then compositing it back in. Not cheap. So the only way sometimes to prove that is to take it as far as these were so that JJ gets the idea. I'm going to move a little bit quicker here. Some more variations, my cockatoo version of a Klingon. Some gang scarring and uh, tattooing on the eye. Teardrop would have been not just enough, so gave him a little bit more Klingon. I think that says kill or death or something like that. I had to learn Klingon for this project. I forgotten all of it, just like Spanish. Yeah, I learned that in high school, that went. And then this one was more indicative of where I was hoping to go with it, to spread the, the features all over the head, the sternum and the back and down the, uh, the neck as well. In addition to that, I really felt like embellishing him in kind of a tribal um, way with scarification, tattooing, piercings, et cetera, et cetera. And the piercings on his forehead, if you don't know this, are actually the bird of prey um, ship in plan view that's altered to feel more like a piercing. So there's, for me, I have to have a reason behind every move I make, and a, there's two reasons why. One, I just can't operate any other way. And two, when your client says to you, what the hell's on his forehead? Well, I don't really know what I thought was cool. That doesn't sell it. But when you say, oh, it's the bird of prey, I remember JJ going, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so it helps if you've got reasons behind your choices. It helps you actually come up with them, and then it helps you sell them. And we printed, <clears throat> that was the only thing that we printed out on this particular character, were those pieces on the forehead. And we had them cast in bronze so that it had the heft and the weight and the feel both to the actor um, and to the camera. I don't think you ever see it in the movie, quite frankly. But you get the idea. They were a pile of fun, that's for sure, to do. And then to see the actors in this makeup um, was pretty thrilling. So moving on, that was kind of the final design. I had this idea that we do braids, kind of dreads that had this protective um, headdress on it that each of these little met metallic panels was woven into it. I thought it was good from the standpoint of a helmet combined with hair. Then we, exp 
mm, played with color just a little bit. We knew that they were going to be dark. I didn't want to just go brown. I wanted to go kind of a blue-brown. And this I shouldn't have included because it's just way too damn many, but it's all the helmet hair combinations. Um, it's one helmet design that we already has established in a previous Star Trek, but it's all the variations that are going to be kind of the indicator for what the various Klingons would be in the movie. So on to Prometheus. I have about two hours of presentation here, but yeah. So one of the greatest privileges for me was working with Ridley Scott because he and of course George Lucas set the tone for my life with Star Wars and with Alien. So getting to sit in a room with Ridley Scott and have him, well, just getting to sit in the room with Ridley Scott was enough. I was like, I don't have to work, you can fire me right now. But getting to sit in a room with him repeatedly and talk about Alien was weird. And then go on tangents talking about Black Hawk Down, Legend, I mean, every film that we were talking about that I would bring up as inspiration. It's like, hey, uh, Ridley, did you ever see that one film where there's that scene, oh right, you did that movie. Well, how about there's one other movie where we, no, that was yours too. All right, okay, so you've done everything. So what Ridley Scott would do, which was great, he can draw, if you don't know it, these are his drawings and this is not <laughs> the best reference of his drawing skills. You'll see it a little bit later, but he can draw and he can communicate very, very quickly. So my first meeting with him, we were talking about the first infected, which was a character, Fifield actually, the guy with the red hair, uh, red beard rather, and the tattoo on his face. So we were talking about that character, what happens to him. The script was not done, so we're calling it first infected. And you can see in every drawing, he's already indicating that head shape, which I hope any alien fan here knows what that head shape is. It's an egg. Anyone know what it is? Raise your hand if you know, because I'm not gonna say it unless, one? Wow, okay, it's a huge penis. If you didn't know, <laughs> swear to God. And it's important because half my pre presentation here is chock full of genitalia. And there's a reason why, I'm not kidding. It's H.R. It's Giger, who was the designer, who is incredible, who set the tone for all the alien films. Um, if you ever get a chance to look at his artwork, go online, turn safe search off so you get to see the full body of his work, uh, you will discover that he is very inspired by uh, human anatomy of a specific region. And because of that, I had no choice but to make sure that the designs that I was doing had the same vibe. Made research really fun. So Ridley had explained what he wanted with this, gave me some sketches, and my thought was to get in there super quick and communicate the next day to Ridley from his sketches in ZBrush what that idea could be. So these are all very soft, they're not resolved, they're awkward in a lot of ways. But this was the next day after I got that sketch from Ridley. And I mean, I, this was not like a half hour model or a one hour model. I, I worked pretty long just trying to like figure out what I was doing and what was the appropriate level of penis and giger. This one though, is, I don't know if you saw it as it spun around, but oh, it's there flopped off on the back. And yeah, I went there. And why? It was one of the first and probably only franchises that uh, it made sense to do that. And it was out of respect for the franchise. So when Ridley saw these, he was blown away. Not necessarily by what I was doing, but by the fact that I just gave you a sketch yesterday and I'm seeing it three-dimensionally today. This is amazing. This is how I want you to continue to work. So Carlos Huante, who's an amazing concept designer, creature designer specifically, he and I were kind of tag teaming a lot of these creatures um, before it went to London and um, some of it was retained and some of it was just changed. But a good majority of what Carlos and I were doing were trying to keep the, the Giger aesthetic. And I was using, if you're not familiar with it, um, the morphing as opposed to rigging within ZBrush to get this character to unfold, because that was a critical part of this particular scene. Guy comes out, sees a rock, pokes it with a stick, rock stands up, Fs him up. And with the time that we had and the knowledge I had, I didn't know how to rig, still don't, um, but I wanted to quickly show that idea. And that's one of the great things about using the timeline and um, this animation process, you can really communicate coarsely if you don't have the time, but I think elegantly as well if you have the time. 
The mouth, tricky thing, because the guy just got the disease for the first time. So I'm trying to figure out how we can get that mouth to project out of the head and still feel viable. There's no way to reconcile the biology of this at all. I tried, uh, but it just makes no sense that at some point a second mouth grows inside of him. But that's okay, because we're just trying to get the general idea across, see if this various form language is going to work. Um, if you know Noman, uh, there's a guy named Alex Alvarez, who's the founder of Noman. I've worked with him on a number of productions, and I've known him for years as a friend. So I occasionally call him and ask for his help in trying to rig something very quickly or light something properly, and he's been wonderful in taking some of my models. He did it on Avatar with me, which is fantastic. He became kind of our in-house guy to make stuff look much more realistic. And really didn't like the look of the Giger aesthetic, so that was out. So Carlos and I are now tag teaming a cleaner surfacing. It's still kind of got the Giger silhouette, but the surfacing is much smoother, much more fetal, if you will, or embryonic. And again, I would take his sketches and quickly sketch it out dimensionally. And what it did was it would prove that the sketch actually did not work. Or I would take a sketch and start to apply materials in Modo, because what Ridley was looking for is the head to have this translucency to it, and you'd see some of the, uh, the formation of this fetal type of creature. And just to point out something else that Ridley was asking for is he would say, I'm gonna light it like so. Can you make it look more like this? And he would call out a light source, single, rimlet. It's gonna be a 4K, it's gonna be a 10K. We're gonna use a xenon over the top. We're gonna to smoke it out. All those things were factors in how I would communicate some of the designs because he was not as specific about the design as much as how, what's it gonna look like on screen when it's lit. So some of the stuff that we did was either making it move, not worrying about its aesthetic so much, and Weta did some really quick tests based on our um, simple ZBrush models. I'd send them the ZBrush model, they'd rig it, weight it just enough, and infuse it with some life. Sending a quick reference of the baboon example. When I saw that one, I thought, yeah, Ridley's gonna love this. We're gonna have this as our baby alien, our first infected. And because they're just so cool, you know, when, when you have these top, top tier animators doing their thing, it is such, a, that's the greatest privilege for me as a designer. Here's my static thingy. And then you see Avatar, like, good God. I, I get way too much credit for what I do because people often do come up to me and say, your work was amazing on Avatar. It's like, yeah, well, thank you. But actually, it's the several millions of dollars and incredible talent that took my gray model and took our basic 1K textures, if they're even that, and they buttered and spiced up everything to the power of 100. And then the animators brought it to life and the lighters brought it to life. It just the list goes on and on. Sound engineering, Jim, of course. It's a big collaboration.